Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are in the book of Numbers. So turn there in your Bibles, if you will, to Numbers chapter 12. This continues our story about the progression of the people of Israel as they are making laps around the mountain again and again and again and learning from God. And really, what's happening here is, you know, God is not so much teaching the adults and those who are senior citizens in the group, but he's mentoring the younger ones who will actually go into the promised land and be the spiritual leaders of the people there. So here we see uh, another time that God is teaching his people, and it's very similar to how God uh, continually teaches the church. That's, that's why we can take the Old Testament and preach from it, because People haven't changed too much, right. have they? So I want to remind you, these are the siblings of Moses, Miriam and Aaron. And there's some sibling rivalry going on here. I hate that. And that only happens when siblings are not walking with the Lord. Because when siblings are walking with the Lord, there's not rivalry. There is what? Support, <coughs> encouragement, love. That's right, unity, unity in the spirit. Because why? They're following God. And, and where people are following God, there is not only unity, but strength and blessing and lots of love and the fruit of God's spirit. So no one's perfect. So Miriam and Aaron get a little sidetracked by Satan here. And we can learn a lot from what God is teaching us here. So let's look at these verses together. Uh, Numbers 12, beginning with verses 1 and 2. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Uh-oh. They forgot that Yahweh is listening to everything they say. I want you to remember here that the reason Moses is alive today, where we're reading here, of course he's alive in heaven now, <laughs> but the reason he's even alive on earth in Numbers 12 is because Miriam, when she was a child, did what? She was used by God and obedient to God by saving her little brother so he wouldn't be killed by the Egyptians. So here's the same one that saves her little brother to be the leader of the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, God's chosen people, and now she's rising up against Moses. Rising up against Moses. Now, your Bible may say Cushite woman from Cush. Same thing. Okay, Those from Cush were from Ethiopia. Most of those in Ethiopia had black skin. But not everybody. Okay, Remember the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip was able to reach. Most believe he had black skin and, and took the gospel back to Ethiopia and planted Christian churches there. So here we are assuming that Moses' wife had black skin, but only God knows for sure. I mean, she could have been from Ethiopia and, and been of a mixed race. You know, she could be uh, tan skin. She could be totally white. I've, I've seen people with African-American features on their face and their skin's totally white. So that's not the issue, see. And besides this issue about her being Ethiopian, it is, it's a smoke screen. Yes. <laughs> okay. Because the big problem here is Miriam's pride. Now, in the Word of God, usually the man is mentioned first before the female, unless the female is taking authority over the man. So that's why we have that there in verse 1. And all the Bible scholars say the same thing, that, that Miriam is rising up against her brother, and criticizing him. Have you ever been criticized? <laughs> no. Oh, I haven't as a pastor. Never. <laughs> ever. But 
you know what? I didn't even know what criticism was until I refereed upward basketball. <laughs> I mean, I had, these are supposed to be Christian, spirit-filled coaches that are coaching our teams, and they were in my face, screaming at me. How dare you call that a foul? And I remember, you know, before I started refing, you know, there, we had just started upward basketball, and all these kids were fouling, Big kids were fouling the littler kids, and nobody was calling anything, you know, at first. And, and so I said, give me that whistle. So I grabbed the whistle, and I put on a cap, and I said, foul! And I mean, all, everybody started dying laughing. <laughs> we, we finally got some authority here, you know. But, uh, yeah, people don't like it uh, if you start calling foul. Be careful, though, because when you have... A finger pointing at somebody, yeah, 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 yeah. Four, you have what? Three pointing right back at you, right? Because no one is without sin. So therefore, we have to be very careful to be in the will of God to criticize somebody. So you want to pray before you blurt out something, okay? Uh, be sure you use that godly filter that God gave you when you were born again. <laughs> That's one great gift God gives every one of his believers is a filter. But some Christians don't use it. Or maybe they're not changing their filter. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a clogged, dirty filter. So, but yeah, you're going to use that filter and say, God, do you, do you really want me to say that? Is, number one, is it essential? Write that down. Is it essential? Is it something, God, that you are telling me I have to say right now and I can't wait? Is it essential? Or, or God, do you want me to do what you said in the scriptures? And, and Jesus, you said we should go one-on-one -on -one with them in love. And speak the truth in love to them. And, and, and say, hey, I, I love you on my heart. And I always start out with about five positives, like Revelation does to the churches there. You know, you know I, I see your gifts, your giftedness, your blessing to our church. Here's the way you, you are a blessing. Here's, here's the positives about you that I praise God for. And everybody says when you say but it erases everything you just said. That's wrong. That's a worldly thing, okay? The Bible uses the word but. It doesn't erase anything. So when you say but, you're saying there's something else I have to say to you that's different now. And, and the but is there, there's something here that you're doing that I've been praying for you about. And you may not see it about yourself. What does supervision mean? It means somebody is supposed to have vision in a supernatural way to help you see things you don't see about yourself. So allow Jesus to be your supervisor, to help you to see things about yourself that you don't see. And then, and then if God is leading you and, and you realize it is essential, and I must say this to this person now, or a week later, or a month later, or whatever. You know, give them time. Give Holy Spirit time to work. Don't try to play Holy Spirit. You know, because God can change that person's heart. We've seen it so many times. I was, I, there's, there's been times I said, oh, Don, I'm so glad I didn't have to confront that person. God changed them. Praise God. And, and, and it was an issue that was major that needed confrontation, but God changed it. You know, God was a referee blowing the whistle at him, and they finally said, Yes, sir, we're going to do what you're saying. So, so is it essential? And, and then secondly, is it, is it time? Seek God's timing. You know, if it's, if it's an emergency, a 911, like I preached about Sunday, you always go to God first with that 911, don't you? You know, I hope over at Brookshire's, when all, all the, whatever happened over there with the police cars, the ambulance and everything, I hope some people pray. Yeah. Because God needs to intervene. So because uh, most of the time people don't pray, well, then God doesn't work, see? So you want to always pray. You want to always uh, seek the intervention of God to work and, and, and change situations. And so you say, God, is it time now? Uh, is it something that I need to do right now, or can this wait? Do I need to confront them a week later, a month later, six months later, whatever it is? But if it's a 911 right now, and I can't even really think of anything that's that major unless somebody's about to get hurt bad, or, or it's about to uh, 
damage a ministry in the church in a horrible way that, that can't be fixed for a while, okay? Uh, something that would cause a church split would be a 911. You gotta act now. You gotta act now before some wrong decisions are made and people act on emotion rather than God's will. Uh, and then after the time, you, all, you always ask God to help you to know how, how to present it, okay? Now, there were times when Jesus would just get really loud. Uh, Jesus would confront the Pharisees in a very loud, angry way, and, and that was something that was essential right then and right there, and, and he always did it in love. Thank you, babe. Jesus always confronted everybody he confronted, even when he was angry, in love. Because people that were listening need to be changed, and people that uh, were causing the problems needed change. And, and so, uh, usually in the church, we don't start yelling in anger unless it's a 911, okay? And, and it can't wait. And that's very, very rare. That's true. Yeah, it's, it's very infrequent. Uh, so, so you always want to, you know, when you speak the truth in love, you, you know, it's always gentle. And what is gentle? It's not like a little bunny rabbit, okay? It's strength under control. That's what gentle means in the Bible, strength under control. So you're under the control of Holy Spirit in how you're speaking to the person. And you're totally controlled by the Spirit rather than emotion. Um, there have been times when I have needed to confront somebody and they start defending themselves and it's something that is a 911. it's got to be decided right now and sometimes that can get heated and sometimes you can start, you know, going back and forth and that's where I say you got to do ECR. What's ECR? Effective Conflict Resolution. You stop right there, you pray for God's control, God's leadership, God's intervention, God's wisdom and, and you, you take turns talking. You don't interrupt each other. The guy, the guy talking is talking, and the other guy's listening and writing notes. And and so you take turns talking so that so that your emotions don't overtake the situation, and you don't say things you wish you hadn't said. You don't say things out of God's will. So <clears throat> if Miriam and Aaron had done this, they would have never confronted Moses. They would have never. Uh, gone any further with the idea. But see, Satan gave Miriam that idea. Because why? She was a prophetess. Okay, Many people don't know that. But we see in Exodus 15 verses 20 and 21 that she was a prophetess. Let's go ahead and read that together. Exodus 15, 20 and 21 says this. Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. That was right after the great victory in the Red Sea, where the Egyptians were killed miraculously by God. And they walked on dry land with walls of water on each side. So she was celebrating. And she had been lifted up by God to be a prophetess who was leader over the spirit-filled women who were on the praise team. Okay? So, so she had a great position there, but she was under Moses' leadership. Aaron, of course, was the high priest, but again, under Moses' leadership. So, so it, the idea from Satan came to Miriam, and she thought, you know, I disagree. Whatever it was, we're not told. But I, she's saying, I disagree with what Moses is doing. I, I'm his older sister. You know, I saved his life there when I was, he was a little baby. I, you know, I've got a lot of years of experience over Moses. You know, what was it, maybe eight or nine years, you know? And, and she thought she knew better. She thought she could lead better. You know, who, who was Moses that, you know, God can only speak through him? Well, God's spoken through me before. You know, I praise God. I give him all the glory. God's spoken through me before. So, so who is he that we have to do everything he says to do? 
Can Moses not be wrong? And so she's, she's bringing this conspiracy against Moses, seeking either to be higher than Moses in leadership or equal to Moses in leadership when God said Moses is the leader. And Israel wasn't used to that. Israel still wasn't used to having one person telling them this is what God says. Now, wouldn't America be a whole lot better if we had a prophet, a man of God yes. in leadership over the nation saying, this is what God has told me that we should do. Yes. Tear down all the abortion clinics everywhere, wherever they are. Yeah. Bring prayer and the Bible back into the schools yeah. and make it a requirement that every student has to take one Bible class, yeah. like my mom had to. Okay? And I'll tell you what, there'd be a lot less school shootings. Yeah. Be in it. America would be a different place. Yes. So, it's important that we follow the leadership of the Lord. And uh, now, now let's go back to the Ethiopian woman. Many Bible scholars believe this is Zipporah, Moses' wife. But because it's just now become an issue, some Bible scholars speculate and say Zipporah could have died and then Moses married an Ethiopian woman after Zipporah. And Miriam didn't like that. And she's using that as an excuse to come against Moses. So, we don't know if that's an issue or not. Uh, it, it's possible that Miriam wanted to racially purify the Israelites so that all in the group would be 100% pure Jewish in their race. But nowhere in the Bible does God say not to marry a non-Jew in race to his people. But what he does say is, don't marry someone of a different religion because you'll start worshiping false gods, which is what happened later. Okay. So not only did they marry someone of a different race and culture and ethnicity, but they also married someone of a different religion, which that, that's where you have to draw the line. Now in the New Testament, we're told that when when a believer is married to an unbeliever, let's say, let's say two people are unbelievers and one of them becomes converted and receives Jesus. And now you've got an unbeliever and a believer married. The New Testament says believers stay married to that person and pray for them and love them to the Lord. Seek to do that. But if they leave, let them leave. So it's important that we remember that. And of course that's something that, that God wants all people to be saved. Uh, so, she comes against Moses with that reason, that she doesn't like that Ethiopian. And maybe maybe her and that lady didn't get along very well. Maybe she got along great with Zipporah, and now she didn't get along at all with this new wife, if, if that's the case. So, uh, But it's still a smokescreen, isn't it? And the Lord heard this. Uh, has the Lord indeed spoken through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? So, so she's wanting to start Baptist voting here. <laughs> we're, not, we're not just going to salute Moses anymore and say, yeah, everything he says is God's will. We're, we're, we're going to all talk about it. We're all, we're all going to decide together and take a vote. Two out of three win, right? No. So God says, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want that. Moses is my leader. No, the man Moses was very humble. More than all men who were on the face of the earth. Wow. Now, if you believe the word of God is the word of God, then this is truth. That Moses was the most humble man on earth, and God is proclaiming that. So what does that word humble mean? You know what, we know what it really means more than anything else? is totally reliant on God. Because remember, Moses said... I can't talk very well, God. I use my brother Aaron, you know, humility. You know, I, who am I that you would use me to be the leader of your people? Humility. We're no one. The Bible says we're worms, but with Jesus in our heart, we're butterflies, right? But powerful butterflies, strong butterflies. So Moses realized that, that 
it, it's God doing all this. It's God that departed the Red Sea and defeated the Egyptians, not me. So he was very thankful. He was very uh, grateful that, that God had used him like he did. And if you, if you look at the scriptures afterwards, Moses had all the right in the world to come against them and say, who do you think you are? I thought you were my friends. I thought you were on my side. I thought you were my greatest encouragers. Well, doesn't, doesn't Satan do that sometimes? You, you think somebody is, is 100% reliable and trustworthy, and then bam. But everybody sins. And somebody who is walking with God like Moses, who is humble and dependent on God, is going to say, hey, you know, I messed up. I'm sorry. I was wrong. They're not gonna. They're not gonna be like old fawns, are they? I was wrong. I can't say the word. You know. They're gonna. They're gonna say I was wrong. I'm sorry. We pray for me. Is there anything I can do to make up for what I've done to sin against you and harm you? So, so Moses didn't didn't rise up against them. What did he do? <laughs> Like water off a duck's back, folks. He was like, Miriam, whatever. He gave her the big W with his fingers, didn't he? <laughs> whatever. And just walked away. Why? You say that tonight. Because he knew God was his defender. And he didn't need to rise up against the siblings. He said, God is my defender. Okay. So suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three. <laughs> sounds, like a, sounds like a daddy, doesn't it, yes. taking his belt off. <laughs> Come over here, you three. <laughs> Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. And there's an exclamation point on my Bible. Yeah. That means Yahweh was kind of loud about it and very direct. You call that an imperative command. Imperative command. Uh, you're, you're going to do this. <laughs> don't, don't you know they kind of start shaking a little bit? Oh. I mean, what if, what if all of a sudden we heard God's voice and God said, come out in front of this church, you people. i got something to tell you. Mm. You know, if we'd been doing something wrong, we, we, no. we might just pass out and die, right? <laughs> yeah. So suddenly the Lord said, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of being. So the three came out. They didn't, they didn't hesitate at all. We're in verse 5. Numbers 12, verse 5. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. Now see, he's singling them out. And Moses, stay where you are. Moses and Miriam take five steps forward. <laughs> And they, and they both went forward. That's speculation. Could have been two steps. <laughs> then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream, but not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful. In other words, in comparison to you two who are unfaithful, Moses is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark things, as he was the form, as he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Wow. Better be careful. Better be sure somebody's in the wrong when you confront them and criticize them. Because, see, God is a God of justice. And the law of the harvest says you will reap what you sow. You bless someone, you'll be blessed. You curse someone, you will be cursed. Mary's about to find that out. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. When the cloud departed from the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. Wow. Instantly. Just like Jesus would take a leper and touch him 
and they're instantly healed all over. God can touch someone and their whole body turns white with leprosy. And this, there's all kinds of different forms of leprosy and some forms of leprosy is not contagious. This was the worst kind here. Where she was white all over her body, scales all over her body, and very, very contagious. I want you to think about the irony of that. Here she's saying, Moses shouldn't be considered the only leader of God. Moses shouldn't be the one singled out. We should have equal say in the leadership here over Israel. We should have a vote. All the attention shouldn't go on Moses, and now all the attention is on Miriam. Did y'all see Miriam? Look at Miriam! Whoa! Can you, can you imagine her response? I, I can imagine her just screaming and probably passing out. See, the Bible doesn't tell us everything. And you know what? Moses could have said, <laughs> Mary, you got what you deserve, baby. No, that's prideful, isn't it? Yeah. You know, when you come against somebody that criticizes you and you get in their face and say, what about you? That's pride, isn't it? How dare you criticize? You know when somebody criticizes you, there's usually some truth in it. Not always. But usually there's some truth in what they're saying because, see, they can see things you're not seeing. And maybe, maybe it's not true, but you're coming across that way for some reason. And that's why we all need to be open and accountable to each other because we can help each other that way. We need to have an accountability ministry team, don't we? In the future of our church, that'd be awesome, wouldn't it? So Aaron said to Moses, oh my Lord. Wow, I wonder how long it's been since he's called Moses his Lord. Now, of course, that's not equal to God. That's little L. That just means my leader. Please do not lay this sin on us. He's, he's scared he's going to get it next. <laughs> But see, Mo, Miriam was the leader. A Aaron just, remember when he went, just went along with the golden calf, just went along, and, okay, whatever. You, know. you got to make a stand. You can't ride the fence. you got to do God's will. Please do not lay this sin on us, in which we have done foolishly, and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead, whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of the, his mother's womb. So, so when a baby dies in the womb and it's, it's dead and they bring the baby out, the, the baby's already decomposing and, and looks like a leper, really, because the skin has, has changed and, and even taken a white look to it. So uh, verse 13, so Moses cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her. Oh God, I pray. Wow. Moses just forgets everything she did. The conspiracy she was trying to rise up. You know, she could have been trying to form her own little army like Jezebel. But, but what she, you know, only God knows where her heart was. But you know, Moses, Moses still loves his sister and says, Please, please Lord, heal her. Oh God, I pray. Then the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days. And after that, she may be received again. So the Lord's saying, there's got to be some punishment here, and the people have to see there's consequences. I'm the Lord of the harvest. And the law of the harvest says, when you bless others, you're blessed. When you curse others, you're cursed. There's got to be some consequences. And the people have to learn this. And here we are. We're still learning it today, aren't we? We're still reading it today. Verse 15. So Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not journey on till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people moved from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Parath. Okay. So there's many things that we learn from this. There's many things that we need to pass on to others. So 
The title of the message tonight is, Watch, watch Your Mouth. <laughs> now, in Texas, we say, Watch Your Mouth, Why You Are. And uh, most of the teenagers will say, Watch Your Mouth. Because why? God is listening. Yeah. And we need to speak words from God. So before we ever speak a word, number one, we must carefully discern our thoughts are from the Lord. We must carefully discern if our thoughts are from the Lord or from the devil. It's one or the other. There's no gray area. Some, some, people, some people in the world today, especially liberals, they'll say, oh, come on now, preacher, there's some gray areas there now. It's either God's will or it's not. That's what the Bible says. And sometimes it's hard to discern that, especially when it's not in the Bible. You know, uh, our men that are renovating our doors and, and our little entrance area here, they, they painted the walls kind of a off-white. Well, how many people wanted beige? We didn't vote on that. Are we going to make a big deal about it? Are we going to scream and, oh, we should have voted? You know, make a mountain out of a molehill. But Really discern, is that from the Lord or from the devil? And see, Miriam didn't know it, but she may have known it. Only God knows the heart. But it was from the devil. Miriam was being led by the devil to oppose Moses, who was acting in the will of God. Not 100% perfect, but most of the time. Okay. By the way, he's one of my three dayers. If you don't know what that is, I have heroes of the faith in the Bible that I believe they could go three days without sinning. I think Moses was one of those. They had to mature to that, see? They had to mature to that, to where they walked with the Lord and heard from the Lord and obeyed the Lord most of the time. Daniel, I believe, was one. Um, I believe the Apostle John grew into that as well. But, you know, only God knows for sure. But that's to me, that's what we should strive for. In the power of Jesus to be like them. To be like those that live for Jesus, Yahweh, most of the time. But, but we, need to, we need to really pray about it. If we're not sure it's from the Lord, we, we certainly need to pray about it before we say a word or do a thing. Okay? And then number two. Before we ever speak a word, we must remember that the Lord is always listening. And we see that in verse 2b. We must remember that the Lord is always listening. And just because we don't see God doesn't mean He's not there. That's right. He's always there. And He's always listening. And that, that should keep us careful, right? That should keep us allowing God's filter to keep us from speaking before we just speak our mind or speak from emotions but we speak from the will of God and by the spirit of God number three before we ever speak a word we must remember that words have the power to bless and the power to curse the speaker and the hearer we see that in verses 3 through 16 so words have power folks and we need to be careful what words come out of our mouth. I've, I've seen people commit suicide yeah. over somebody <coughs> blowing up on them and then later saying, Oh, I didn't mean a word I said. Well, it's too late now. So it's so, it's so you know, all, all, how many people are born again Christians right now that bullied somebody when they were kids? And could have committed, could have caused that child to commit suicide because they were being bullied every day by that person who became a Christian. See, it, it, parents teach your children. Yeah. Yeah. Satan can use children in horrible, horrible ways to, to to cause a lot of damage to other children. But that's why the Lord says, "Be careful what you say," because. If you speak for God, it's going to bless people. Even if you have to confront someone and say they're wrong and need to repent of the sin, it's still going to bless them if you do it the right way. If you're not critical and hateful. In 
prideful. But if you're loving and kind, and you're saying it because you really love that person and, and want to see God help them. Want to see God bless them. Then it will lead to blessing like it did when Jesus spoke those words. And it can have the power to curse. And, it, and I'll tell you, even a Christian can be punished by God. God says it over and over in His Word. I will punish you. And what loving parent did not punish the children? So repent before I have to punish you because of your sin. And here's a bunch of verses, and we have some time. I won't, I won't take you after time tonight, but uh, I want to go over some of these tonight. So um, Psalm 19 and verse 14. Psalm 19 and verse 14. If you get there before I do, go ahead and read it. Psalm 19, 14. Because my mic went out, I only have one hand to use, so it's kind of hard to turn these pages. <clears throat> okay, here it is. Psalm 19 and verse 14 says this. One more page. One more page. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I love that verse. I love that verse. So that should be our prayer all the time, shouldn't it? Now we'll, we'll do the Bible drill. Let's see who gets there first. Psalm 119, 105. Psalm 119 and verse 105. Okay, your pastor won. <laughs> Psalm 119, 105 says this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's a great one, isn't it? Yeah. So if you know God's word, you know his will, and you know what God speaks. So let God speak through you. You can't be wrong. Psalm 141, verse 3. Let's see who gets there first. Psalm 141. Amen. Frankie Beatman. <laughs> That's a great one too. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Well, don't some church members need that one? Maybe we should have the muzzle of war. The person who can't the person who can't keep their mouth shut. And, no, I don't see that in the Bible. So let's we'll pray about that one, right? Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Wow. That's a great one. Proverbs 10 and verse 19 says this. I went right to it. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. In other words, you ever, you ever know somebody just can't be quiet? Just, and, and eventually... <laughs> Eventually, they're going to say something stupid, aren't they? They're going to say something out of God's will. They're going to say something from Satan. So be careful not to talk too much. Say what God wants you to say. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is what? Wise. Proverbs 11, verse 12. He who is devoid of wisdom despises his neighbor. But a man of understanding holds his peace. Proverbs 12, verse 18. There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes what? Health. Wow. Healing. The tongue of the wise promotes healing and health. Amen. Proverbs 13, 3. He who guards his mouth preserves his life. But he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Proverbs 16, verse 24. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb. Sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Amen and amen. 
We still have some time, so turn to Matthew 12. And look at what Jesus says here. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. Jesus says this. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. That's Christians too, isn't it? That's not just unbelievers. Every man, every person will give an account of the words they speak. For by your word you'll be justified and by your word you'll be condemned. So is, is somebody condemned and, and sent to hell because they speak a lot of things they shouldn't speak? Yes. But the reason they do that is because they never were saved. Because saved people learn to allow God to control their tongue. Oh, preacher, that's judgmental now. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. So that's called the Bema Seat Judgment. And in the Bema Seat Judgment, all of us will wish we had spoken more words to bless others and to bless God. And we will all wish we had sinned less. Because in the Bema Seat Judgment, God gives out His rewards. And we're all going to wish we had more rewards to lay at his feet. Luke 6, 45. Luke chapter 6, and verse 45. Jesus says this. Look one more page. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So what's in your soul is going to come out of your mouth. And if you're saved, it's going to bless people. If you're lost, it's going to curse people. If you're saved, you're going to let God speak through you. Because it's natural. It's like breathing. But if you're lost and condemned and Satan's in you, it's just going to be dark. It's going to be negative, it's going to be critical, it's going to be prideful, it's going to be demonic. So that's, that's why a new Christian has to repent of all those things. You know, a new Christian many times looks like a lost person, but if they're born again, God's going to help them grow up, isn't he? God's going to help them mature. Ephesians 4, 29. Ephesians 4. Verse 29 says this. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But what? What is good for necessary edification. In other words, building up others. Encouraging others. That it may impart grace to the hearers. We ought to have these scriptures all over our church. Church. <laughs> All over the walls. Uh, Colossians 3 8. Now, by the way, most of the people in our church bless others with their words. I want to be sure to say that. But it doesn't hurt to be reminded of these things from time to time, though. Yeah. Colossians 3 8. But now you must put aside all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Filthy language out of your mouth. Yeah. Let's just go on and read the rest of that. It's really good. Do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who was renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And then Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. I love that. And then 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. These are some of my favorite scriptures that were used in my ordination service. For 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now look, look how the Bible should be used. It should be used with the way that we talk. It's profitable for doctrine what we believe, how we interpret the Word of God, uh, how we interpret God's will, 
Uh, it's profitable for reproof. That's what we've been talking about. You know, coming before someone and telling them, hey, you know, I love you, but I'm praying for you. You need to seek God's power to overcome that sin. That's reproof for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, that means mature, spiritually mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And we don't have time, I told you I'd get you out on time, so uh, these are great ones too. And I, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to fib a little bit. We're going to read it because they're too good not to. <laughs> James 1.26. See there, I should have never told you I'd get you out on time. Mm -hmm. But I had what, good intentions, didn't I? Mm -hmm. James 1.26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is what? Useless. That's what Jesus calls impure religion. It's, it's the religion of the devil. And one more, 1 Peter 4.11. 1 Peter 4.11. If anyone speaks, let him speak the very oracles or words of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. Thank you, God, for reminding us how we are to seek your will, your spirit, your power, your wisdom every moment of every day. That, God, we would not speak a word unless we're sure it's from you, unless we're sure that you are leading us to say it in the way and the timing of saying it. God, help us. Help us to be by your spirit to grow in this area that we be able to mentor others how to speak for God in this world and how to remain silent when Satan is tempting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for listening. May God bless you.